Hi everyone, welcome to Making It Brain. Um, we're going to get started in just a minute. I can see the numbers are still climbing in the participants box. So there's over 160 of you joined so far. So please, um, as you're joining, say hello in the chat and let us know where you're from. So we've got people here from London, from Ireland, West Yorkshire, Bradford, Sheffield, Singapore, Birmingham, London, Sheffield, London, East London, South London, West London. Hello and welcome everyone. Got people from Cambridge, Surrey, Hull, Dublin, Nottingham, England, Leash, Ireland, Winchester, Middlesbrough, the Philippines, incredible. More London. Welcome everyone. It's great to see such um, a huge number of you joining us today uh, for this Making a Brain event. And um, we have, as I mentioned, a huge international audience. So welcome. We're um, uh, based in the UK at the UK Dementia Research Institute. Um, my name is Kleena and I'm going to be your host for this year's Making a Brain. Um, and the session is split over two Day. So today, this afternoon from 4 until 5.30 um, British summertime and the same again tomorrow. So as we get started, um, this is what our schedule for today looks like. So we have um, some longer speakers um, and these are Dr. Joe Jackson and Professor Sonia Gandhi, who will bring us through what their careers look like and also what their research entails. We'll have some look into the lab. So we have follow me around the lab videos, showing you what it's like to actually work inside a working lab. We've got some flash talks from PhD student, research assistants and research coordinators today as well. And um, so we're hoping to give you quite um, a wide and broad picture of what it's like to work in science and particularly in dementia research. So my name is Kleena and I'm gonna be hosting today and tomorrow. And I am a PhD student based in University College London. So I am a scientist studying neuroscience and my scientific journey started back in secondary school when I um, took part in the science fair. So it's a national science fair in Ireland um, where I had a project very far from neuroscience. It was actually kind of a botany based project where I looked at plants and pesticides, but it gave me my first real insight in what it's like to actually do um, a research project and kind of ask a scientific question and come up with the answers myself. And in school, um, some of the subjects I studied for my final school exams included biology, chemistry, geography and maths. And um, from there, I decided that I wanted to pursue science in university. And um, so I studied general science in Trinity College Dublin for two years. And then I specialized in neuroscience because I really had an interest in what the brain does um, and how it carries out its functions and, and controls our bodies. And this was my first experience with a, a real research project working in a lab and consistently kind of generating my own data. And I really, really enjoyed this. And so I decided to pursue science as a career option. And I got a job as a research assistant and so I started this job in 2020, so just before the pandemic. Um, and this was also in Dublin. And this was really where I learned how to do a lot more lab techniques, how to feel more comfortable working in a lab and getting a lot more experience. And as I enjoyed this so much, I applied to do my PhD in um, London at University College London, working on dementia research. Um, and as I've written here um, at the bottom, the best bit about this job is that it's really varied every day. I get to do lots of different things um, from working in the lab at the bench to writing research papers and reading research um, studies to doing completely opposite things like presenting webinars like this and also speaking about my research to the public, as you can see in this photo. Um, and so as we continue uh, through today and we hear from our other speakers, um, lots of people will bring you through their different career journeys and how they got to where they are today. Um, so just briefly before we get, begin, I mentioned that we are hosting this from the UK Dementia Research Institute. 
um, and we are a research institute based all across the UK that studies dementia. And so some of you may have heard of dementia. We generally associate it with elderly people, or you may know someone with dementia. Um, but what we want you to understand is that dementia is an umbrella term for loss of memory and other thinking abilities severe enough to interfere with our daily life. Um, but this is an umbrella term, meaning it's describing symptoms that people experience. And it's a symptom of many different diseases. And these include Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and other types of dementia. And so this is an overall symptom describing something that happens during a disease. And we here at the UK DRI are spread across lots of different centres. We have Edinburgh in Scotland, Cardiff in Wales, um, Cambridge University, and then three universities in London, Imperial, UCL, and King's College. And across these different centres, we use, we use a huge variety of research techniques to study these different diseases, including um, cells, animal models like flies or mice, we can use more clinical methods like MRI scanning and measuring compounds in people's blood. So today you're gonna to hear from a lot of dementia researchers and some of the questions that they are tackling are, why do people get dementia? How can we treat dementia? Who will get dementia? What happens in brain cells during dementia causing diseases? How can we better diagnose people with dementia? And what molecules are changing in the brain during these diseases? So we're going to hear people touching on all of these questions and more today and tomorrow. So this is our schedule for today and we're going to start our talks with Dr Jo Jackson from the UK DRI at Imperial College London where she's going to talk about her research and also her career journey. And so with that Jo I'll hand it over to you for your talk. Thank you very much, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, I'm hoping uh, that everyone can see my slides. Uh, please shout uh, if you can't. Um, so as, as you've just heard, I'm Dr. Jo Jackson. I am an advanced research fellow at the UK DRI Centre at Imperial College. And I'm going to talk to you today about our research project where we have investigated one of the main risk variants, something that causes, uh, or that we think causes, and increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, I encourage you to follow me on uh, Twitter. I tweet a lot about uh, neuroscience, but also about uh, increasing uh, diversity and inclusion uh, in, in the neuroscience field. So I'm gonna, oops. Okay, so to give you an overview of my talk, I'm going to, uh, first of all, just give you a, a quick a couple of minutes um, overview on my career journey, uh, roughly what my day-to-day -day, uh, life looks like, and a few things that I've learned uh, along the way. And then I'm going to delve into, uh, as I said, one particular study where we have looked at uh, a particular genetic variant that increases the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease. I will touch upon what are the challenges of studying Alzheimer's and then why in my group we use uh, something called multiomics to study Alzheimer's disease and I will talk about what multiomics actually means and then go into this uh, a trend to a uh, risk variant which um, I, I then came up with the, the catchy title of a tremendous risk and I will try and uh, talk you through why I think so first of all, uh, just to give you then an overview of my career uh, journey to date. Well, I, uh, I went to university, I did three sciences at, at A level, biology, chemistry and physics. I then went to university and did an undergraduate uh, degree in physiology and a master's in neuroscience. I then moved to Imperial College where I did a PhD um, uh, in uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. And then I went on to do a postdoc, and that is a, a research position after my PhD at Lund University in Sweden. I then, uh, I came after another very, very brief uh, postdoc position back at Imperial, 
I then um, had the opportunity to move to industry. And that was to the pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly, that was uh, based just outside London. And there, um, again, I, I took up a, a postdoc position as they were looking to set up a particular type of advanced microscopy that I had, had done previously uh, in the context of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So I moved to Eli Lilly, uh, did a postdoc position and was then offered a permanent uh, research position uh, as a research scientist. And then I progressed to senior research scientist. Um, however, after eight years I, at uh, Lilly, I decided to leave industry um, and come back to academia, which often it doesn't happen that often, but I, I made that move. And uh, in 2019, I moved, uh, I came back again to Imperial College, but this time working uh, and based at the UK um, Dementia Research Institute Centre and the UK DRI was still in its early days uh, back then. And I've been uh, in the UK DRI uh, since then. And um, I have been leading a big multi-omics atlas project. As I said, I would dis uh, describe what that means in a minute. Um, but I recently have just acquired funding to um, take my research in a new direction. And I will be starting that in, in January, but still based at the centre. So what do I do as a, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis? Well, I wanted to add these pie charts as comparison. I was trying to work out the time I spent with different activities when I was doing my PhD and when I was doing that, that postdoc, that research position um, after my PhD. And as you can see here, the majority of time I spent during these positions is on lab work or analysis. So really the main focus there, about three quarters of my time or so was spent in the lab or analyzing data. I, I would do uh, bits of, uh, I would do some paper writing. Um, obviously there's always admin and to be done and meetings. And then when I became a, a postdoc, I was uh, managing um, more staff, but really the majority of my time was, was lab-based. However, what do I do now? And you will see uh, the change. And so here you can see this dark uh, gray slither that is uh, the lab work or data analysis that I do. And actually it's, uh, my team always look a bit horrified when they see me uh, appear in the lab. And um, so I, it, unfortunately it's very little at the moment, but I still try to do some, but I spend a lot of my time writing uh, papers, or writing grants and grants this is a way to get money for basically my next study my next set of experiments i also spend a lot more time in in meetings um, and managing staff however i particularly like those because i get to um, drive research forward the research that my team is doing and also it's an opportunity to help more junior members um, of my team and of the center I also um, spend quite a bit of time doing what we call service. And as I touched upon at the beginning, this is, um, I lead an initiative within uh, a department to increase diversity and inclusion uh, in science. And that is to uh, change the culture of science so that it is really truly open to everyone and everyone gets an opportunity to thrive. And I, I spend a fair bit of time doing that and thoroughly enjoy it and uh, feel like uh, we are slowly making a difference. Oops. So, but what have I learned along the way? Well, first of all, and I'm happy to discuss this in more detail in the Q&A, that industry and acad or, or academia is not a binding decision. There is, we can move between the two. It has its challenges move, moving between the two, but it is possible. Also that career paths are not necessarily linear. I left academia for eight years and have come back. I know people that have done other things along the way. So it's uh, important not to get too hung up on this linear career path. And along the way, you pick up a number of skills, both scientific, but also the non-scientific, the managing people, the managing uh, budgets. Um, and it's important to pick up those skills 
And this adds to your breadth of knowledge that you uh, pick up along the way. And then you also have your areas of uh, deep knowledge, and that is usually uh, your science. It's important, I think, whatever career stage you're at, to build uh, a network of mentors and sponsors. And that can be in both directions. And I, as I said, I really enjoy mentoring more early career researchers as well. And as you move up, building that network and keeping in touch with people who are not only more senior than you, but also at a similar level, because you are then able to call upon them years down the line uh, for advice and support. And that has been invaluable to me. And then we are, we are all as, you know, we all love science, we enjoy the science we do, but it, there has to be a balance. Uh, and that again is whatever life stage you are at. Um, I found it uh, a bit more recently since becoming a, a parent, how important that is. Um, and we need to bear that in mind. And as I've said, equity, diversity and inclusion is very important in science. We need to make it more diverse and more inclusive. And I regret in my early uh, career days, not pointing out some of the bad practices that were uh, going on that thankfully you see less of now nowadays. But also uh, it's important that we all have uh, the confidence and stand up when we see those bad practices um, and celebrate the good ones. And unfortunately, or fortunately, luck plays a little bit of a part of this. I, there have been some cases where I've been at the right place in the right time. Uh, and that has been important and played a part in my career journey. However, throughout my whole career journey, I focused on uh, dementia, neurodegeneration. This is when, particularly with age, the brain starts to degenerate. First of all, uh, during my PhD in Parkinson's disease, and then more recently in Alzheimer's. And um, as was mentioned at the beginning, I think you all will have heard of dementia and, and maybe Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it is a very complex disorder with an interaction of genes, environment, and aging is the main uh, risk factor. And it involves multiple cell populations. So you have your Alzheimer's disease, but then you have these main pathological hallmarks. And in the case of Alzheimer's, that is hyperphosphorylated tau, which is a protein usually found in neurons, but it aggregates and forms these uh, inclusions uh, within the cell, within the neurons in particular, or you have these extracellular plaques, these fluffy balls of beta amyloid that form outside of the cell. There are multiple disease mechanisms in place, and, and uh, these are oxidative stress, damaged mitochondria, calcium is affected. You also get these pathological hallmarks forming at synapses, and synapses are the connections between neurons by which the neurons communicate with each other. And they, these then lead to downstream consequences and things such as synaptic dysfunction. And this is a, a, an active area of my research program. However, I'm not going to discuss that today because you are hearing from the amazing Tara Spires Jones tomorrow, so I will leave that to her. It, this then leads to a lot of the functional impairments that we all associate with the disease. So things like memory loss and synaptic dysfunction and uh, neuronal loss is associated with this cognitive impairment. So because it's such a complex disorder, we use um, a, a, a program of work called multiomics. And just to then give you an overview of what multiomics is, it enables us to analyze of what are called ohms. And these are different layers of biology um, which enable the cell to function. So for example, we start with epigenetics, which, um, which affects how, uh, which genes are switched on and off. And it then enables us to look at other different ohms, such as the genetics of the person, the transcriptomics, which is RNA, which is the blueprint essentially for when then proteins are, uh, are translated, the RNA is translated into proteins. We can compare them between these different ohms. Now in our multiomics project, we can also compare between different stages of the disease. 
and different brain regions. And we know that brain, brain regions are affected at different stages. This means we then have this multi-platform approach looking at multiple regions at these different stages. And there's a few ways we can do this. And this is either where we take a piece of human brain tissue and we mush it up and we then look at, for example, the genes that are expressed. So we look at the RNA, that blueprint, and you get, uh, we can look at how these different levels of RNA and how these change between different groups that we know are affected uh, by Alzheimer's disease. What that doesn't tell us, however, is what cells are actually involved. So essentially, we've got our smoothie with all the different cell types involved. There's then another way where we can separate out, if you like, the different fruits from the smoothie and all we can separate, separate out the different cell types. And we can look at the genes that are expressed, the RNA, and we can say, OK, that's from this group of neurons, for example. Or we can then look, and this is where the field is going, at how, uh, where the RNA is expressed and how that uh, differs in different cell types in relation to those pathological hallmarks. And so you can see an example here. This is actually an example of a protein that's been stained, but now we're starting to do the same with RNA. For the purposes of today, however, I'm going to focus on transcriptomics. That's looking at RNA, the blueprint, um, which, um, which enables proteins to then be uh, translated. Um, and I will focus on single cells that we know basically which fruits are making up our smoothie. So which cells are involved. I'll focus on a TREM2, uh, the TREM2 risk variant. And this is uh, expressed in the microglia of the brain. They are the immune cells of the brain. TREM2 has a number of functions. One of its functions is to basically bind to the beta amyloid that forms the plaques and to help the microglia clear and protect the brain from the amyloid. If you have a, a variant, a genetic variant of TREM2, you, that increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And there are two variants, main variants. One increases your risk by about four times and the other one, the R62, by about two times. And they have an earlier onset of uh, Alzheimer's symptoms and they progress faster. And I'm going to focus on three cell types. First of all, the neurons. And I wanted to use a, a football analogy here. So if you think of the neurons in the brain, they are the ones that scoring the goals. They are um, involved in the synaptic transmission, the passing of messages from one neuron to another. They are supported by the astrocytes, the midfielders, if you like. And they, um, as I said, they, the astrocytes support the neurons and the health of the neurons. However, astrocytes are also able to defend the brain from certain uh, attacks as well. But really, the main uh, role of, of the defenders, uh, the main defenders in the brain, are what we call the microglia, and they are protecting the brain from attacks by those pathologies. And we found that those brains, those human brains that have the TREM2 risk variants have a reduction in, um, in the uh, activation. So you see that there is a lack of these uh, bright spots where these arrows are in the R47s. That's the ones that confer the greatest risk. However, if you look in the R62s where there's less of a risk, we actually see an increase in this activation there's a hyperactivation. We then moved on to the astrocytes, the midfielders of the brain. And again, we looked at whether they are activated. And we found that there was no real difference in the R47s where there is the greatest risk, but the R62s where there's less of a risk, again, you have this, these really bright spots, this ray activated well, we looked at what happens in the R47s because we thought these astrocytes might be able to help and stop this increase in risk. And we found the involvement of a pathway called NRF2. And this actually supports the health of the neurons. And that is reduced in these R47s. So the astrocytes cannot do their supportive role for the neurons. When it then came to the neurons, I'm just going to move to this a little bit quickly. 
then came to the neurons, they uh, actually had an increase in cell death pathways in the R47s where there is the greatest risk. And you will also see that they had uh, a reduction in pathways that support neuronal health as well as synaptic transmission in the R47s. So the, the neurons are essentially uh, sick in the R47s. So we've just to summarize here, we've shown that the defenders of the brain, the microglia, have reduced activation in our R47s, the cases with the highest risk, but the R62 defenders of the microglia are hyperactivated, are working very hard. We found a similar thing when it came to the astrocytes, the midfielders. There is reduced support to the neurons in the R47s, but in the R62s, again, they're working very, very hard to protect the brain from the pathology. And that is then shown when we look at neurons, the neuronal health is affected in the R47s, but there are limited effects. The brain is relatively protected in the R62s where there is a lower risk. So I'm just going to finish there. It was a whistle stop tour, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic overview of both kind of career aspects and where I really, really like the pie chart representation of how you spend your time. I think that's really good insight for people about what it actually is like to be a scientist at different career stages. Um, and really interesting to hear about the research as well. Um, I can already see questions coming into the Q&A box. So there is a Q&A session at the end of today. And um, so about 5.15, um, where I'll pose the questions in the Q&A to all speakers throughout the day. So thank you so much. And um, our next um, part of the day is a follow me around the lab video. And um, so this was created by Alia and Millie, who are based at the Francis Crick Institute in London. Um, and they're going to show us about what it's like to work in their lab for a day and what they do in their experiments. Hello, my name is Alia and I'm an MSc student undertaking my research project in the Distruper and RNCBL lab housed here at the Francis Crick. Come along with me for a day in my life. Now we're in the communal space of our floor. Um, here you can grab some coffees, you can have some meetings, and just have a bit of a relax once you get into the lab. Okay everyone, so this is our lab over at the Francis Crick as part of the UK DRI. I do, but first and foremost, I have some stainings that I need to get done, so I'll be coming along first to do that. So now we're in the lab and it's time for a quick tour. Our lab focuses on the cellular phases of Alzheimer's disease and we use a range of techniques from transcriptomics to in vivo imaging. We have four benches where we do most of our work and we also have the communal space. Okay, so let's go on with our experiment. One hour later. Let's go on to the light microscopy room um, and we're going to go image our sections. Come on. Okay guys, so behind me you can see that we are now imaging our sections. Um, in pink we have our amyloid plaques, in red we have our tau tangles, in green we have our microglia, and in blue, which will be popping up in a second, we have our nuclei. So we've done our protocol, let's go for lunch. <laughs> Guys, we had a quick lunch and now that I finish up all of my experiments, I'm gonna be spending the rest of the afternoon coding, um, which is what I do usually in the afternoon. Thank you so much to Alia and Millie from the Francis Crick Institute who made that video for us. I think it's a really nice insight into what it's like to work in a wet lab and do some nice imaging of different brain cells. Um, and I hope people appreciated the SpongeBob and the Me music. Um, I hope some of our audience are old enough to remember the, the Wii. Um, so, um, okay, so the first flash talk that we're going to have today um, is from Debbie. Um, Debbie is a PhD student in the University College London and is working on biomarkers in neurodegenerative disease research. So Debbie, I'm going to let you take it away. 
Um, so my name is Deborah Alaude, um, and today I'm going to talk to you about my journey through med school, Alzheimer's research and elite sport. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background about me, um, I grew up in West London and throughout school I was involved in various sports and musical activities, um, but I was always highly academic, so um, I, I always enjoyed like everything. Um, so I started working towards becoming a doctor from year nine onwards. Um, but for my A-levels, I took biology, chemistry and maths and then took physics as an AS. But I'm pretty sure you can't do that anymore in, with the way they've changed the UK um, education system. Um, but my interest in research actually began like again during school. So when I was volunteering at a nursing home um, in order to get into medical school, um, a lot of the residents that work that lived in the nursing home I was volunteering at um, were living with Alzheimer's disease. So in year 13, I was able to take part in like a research project called an extended project qualification. Um, and I titled my research, Are Stem Cells a Possible Answer to Finding a Cure for Alzheimer's Disease? So moving on from there, fast forward to 2016, I got into med school. Um, but throughout my first three years, um, I was heavily involved in various research opportunities and conferences. So um, if I put my pointer on, this was me at a surgical skills conference. Um, and then this was me um, after spending two days shadowing a researcher at a lab in Manchester in my second year of med school. Um, so I realized that I actually quite enjoyed doing research and I would really like, I wanted research to be a massive part of my career as a doctor. So I applied to transfer on to something called the MB PhD program, which is basically where um, partway through your medical degree, you take four years out to do a PhD um, and then go back to finish your last couple of years in med school. But I was actually rejected when I first applied. Um, I was told that um, my application was good, but I just needed a bit more research experience. So I actually already had more research experience lined up that summer anyway, um, doing something called a summer studentship, which was an eight week chance to do more research essentially. Um, so I did that, reapplied the following year and I got in. Um, so my six year degree studying just medicine then became a 10 year degree uh, with a PhD sandwiched in the middle. Um, so I'm doing my PhD as we speak. I'm actually just coming towards the end of it where I'm writing my thesis, which is basically just a massive book about all the work I've done. Um, and just the easiest way to describe my PhD is that I'm developing new tests to diagnose Alzheimer's disease earlier. And I'm, use, I'm testing it, that in fluids, um, in sorry, in cerebrospinal fluid, which is the um, fluid that runs around your brain and spinal cord, but also in blood. Um, but doing the PhD has given me opportunities um, to go to conferences, both in like the UK and also internationally. So this was a conference last November um, in Brighton. Um, this was a conference earlier this year in February um, in the Paris Brain Institute in France. And then this is a picture I took um, at the very, very beginning of my PhD in Sweden. Um, yeah. But obviously I mentioned elite sports. So I started weightlifting um, after the coach I started weightlifting with came to my school and did a six week taster course and then officially started the year after that. So I, I was introduced to it in year 10, but started officially um, in the summer between year 11 and year 12, which was 2014. Um, and since then, I've won various national medals um, and I hold a few under 23 and senior British records. Um, but I've also gone on to represent um, Great Britain and England on the international stage. So I came eighth at European Senior Championships last, um, last year. But most recently, I represented England at the Commonwealth Games um, and I came fourth. Uh, very, very close to coming third. Um, but yeah, I came fourth. And I'm actually due to fly out to Germany in a couple of weeks to represent GB at a small international comp there. So it's quite cool. Um, but obviously balancing weightlifting, medicine and PhD um, can be tricky. Um, it's taken a lot of like a balancing act, essentially. Um, a lot of discipline, a lot of time management. Um, sometimes weightlifting takes a priority. A lot of the times it's more my degree takes a priority. But actually um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, like my days 
are for PhD medicine, etc. Then my evenings are for weightlifting, but not every evening. I don't train every day. Um, and also another challenge is injuries, which is part and part of elite sport. Um, my most recent injury um, was a wrist injury that luckily didn't affect my ability to um, take like do my experiments on a day to day basis. But obviously that put a annoying damper on internationals for this year um but i'm back from injury now which is great and then there's always the question of in exam season do you train or do you not train i'm always on the side of definitely train um regardless of what level of your um degree or school that you are at i think it's important to take time away from um like sitting in the library and staring at books um just to de-stress to think about something other than your exams coming up um, so yeah, I always make sure I leave time to train, um, even during exam season. Um, but yeah, my key take home messages are that academic and sporting excellence can go hand in hand, as I hope you've seen from my journey. Um, but also that it's not too late to try something new, whether it's trying a new sport or trying um, out like or changing, changing your degree partway through, whether that's because you didn't enjoy it or you want to add something extra to it. But also that setbacks are normal. The key is to learn from them. So like whether that's um, in my case injuries or also in my case not getting onto the PhD program the first time and then not letting that um, discourage me from reapplying the second time um, but yeah that's everything for me thank you all for listening thank you so much for that fantastic talk um, it's so inspiring to see how much work you can get done both with your passions inside and outside of kind of your career so that's incredible and congratulations on your recent achievements at the Commonwealth Games as well we're getting a lot of little congratulations messages in the chat and Q&A box as well so everyone is really impressed and um, and I think yeah there's just some incredible messages in your talk including how we've all kind of faced rejection and that you just have to keep going and how important it is to have kind of passions outside of career study um, it's really nice to be able to do it, whether it's sport or art or music. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and we just had some questions um, coming through about Q&A. So Q&A will be at the end of today and tomorrow. And um, so please keep posting the questions in the Q&A box and we'll address them at the end of the session. Um, and also for the recordings of today and tomorrow's sessions, they will all be available on YouTube um, a few days after the event and everyone that registered will be sent a link. And so please don't feel like you have to take everything down right now. Um, so thank you so much to Debbie. And our next speaker is going to be Rachel O'Donoghue, who works at the Cardiff UK Dementia Research Institute and is a research assistant and PhD student studying stem cell models of disease. And um, so Rachel, over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Rachel. I'm a research assistant and PhD student at the Dementia Research Institute at Cardiff. Um, so I'm going to be talking about using stem cells to understand genetics in Alzheimer's disease. But first of all, I'll just quickly go through my career journey. So um, I started doing maths, biology and chemistry A-levels in Carmarthen, um, and that was in 2015. And I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do um, for my degree. I just knew that I enjoyed learning about human biology and health and disease. And I did a bit of research and found that um, a degree called biomedical sciences is quite good for that. Um, sort of focuses on the human biology side of uh, and the, like the health and disease of, of human biology. Um, I chose Bath because personally I really enjoyed the city when I went and visited but it also offered something else called a professional placement um, and I really recommend doing that if um, if you get the opportunity to, to do that whenever you go to university. Um, it basically means just a gap between the second and third year where you can um, apply for different jobs. Um, so I applied for an intern scientist position, which was just a year long thing. Um, and I got paid and I got um, I was able to see what it was like to sort of be in the lab in the real world. And I had quite a lot of independence within that position. Um, and it was definitely where my love for being in the lab sort of grew. It was also first where I heard of uh, what a PhD could be. Um, and sort of when I decided that that was that was what I wanted to do so when I came back to university in my final year which was when COVID hit it was when I wanted to apply for PhD positions but I didn't get much lab experience in my final year because of COVID so that was definitely one of my major career setbacks I think um, when COVID hit and everything was working from home um, so not only did I not get to go into the lab I also um, had to do all of my learning from home and we had to do all of our exams from home which was quite stressful um, but 
I did manage to go over it. It takes a bit of getting used to, but you can definitely get over these things. Um, so when I didn't get a PhD position, I thought I would start applying for research assistant positions. So a research assistant, you're basically assisting a larger project in academia. So I um, found this research assistant position where I work on stem cells and neuroscience, which is largely what I focused on in the final year of my degree. Um, and the people in the group are super friendly and super supportive. So they managed to get me a PhD studentship at the same time as working. So I'm a work, um, I work at the same time as doing my PhD, which can be stressful at times, but they do line up quite well and I've got really good support. So it's definitely doable. Um, but mostly what I wanted to talk about today was what stem cells are and why, how, how we use them in dementia research. Um, so stem cells are um, the cells from an embryo that have the capacity to become any cell type, and that's what we call pluripotency. So pluripotency means can become any cell type of the body, um, and they're all listed here on the screen. We use them to make neural cells, so neurons um, and astrocytes and microglia are all being made in, in the lab here. We mainly focus on microglia, which are basically just the immune cells of the brain, and they really support the neurons. Um, and help prevent infection and clear up debris and everything like that. Um, but obviously we don't we don't always want to take these stem cells from embryos. And so recent developments have been have allowed us to make stem cells, which is where this induced pluripotent stem cell comes from. Um, so we take cells from patients or healthy controls. We take um, in our lab, we take blood, but you can also take skin. And they're both really easily accessible. And then we put them in a dish and we just add these molecules that are reprogramming factors and they change the blood or skin cells into stem cells. And this is a really cool technique. Um, it's really important to know that these stem cells are also self-renewing. Um, and that's a massive advantage for stem cells. So um, when we get the stem cells from the patients, we never have to go back to the patients for any more blood or skin or anything like that because they always self-renew. So we get, they keep dividing and dividing and dividing, and we get millions and millions of cells in the lab. Um, and we can also freeze them down if we don't want to use them and then um, thaw them at a later date and they're still really happy. So um, they're really useful, um, especially the induced pluripotent stem cells. How do I use stem cells to look at the, specifically the genetic changes in disease? So I use something called CRISPR. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it before, but quite a lot of people had, have heard of it. It's a really cool technique. Um, and basically what I do is I introduce something called an enzyme, which is a protein, and it specifically cuts the DNA where I want it to cut. I then introduce, um, so this is within the stem cell, and then I introduce something called a template, which is just a really small piece of DNA, and it's got a mutation that I'm interested in on. Um, so the mutation is in the template in this tiny piece of DNA, and I introduce that into the cell after I've cut it. And then once the, um, the inside the cell, they have their um, machinery within the cell that um, repairs the break. But when I've incorporated the template, it uses the template and sort of copies it into the DNA within the cell. And so that's incorporated the, the mutation into the cell line. And then I also have some cells that I haven't done this to. So I have controls and then I have a mutant cell line. And this is mostly how we look at genetic changes in disease specifically, because everything else in those cells is exactly the same. I've just introduced one tiny mutation and then I can look at these cells side by side and see if there are any differences between them. But what exactly do I do in the lab? So most of my time I spend feeding my cells and keeping my cells alive, sort of like having a little pet. I have to feed them every day and um, keep them happy. So they need really special media. Um, so that's just the liquid that's got soft proteins in it um, to keep them happy. Um, and then I take the stem cells and I turn them into any cell type that I want. So I'm more interested in something called microglia, which is the immune cell. And then what we can do is once they turn into microglia, we can um, take pictures of them. And we can um, locate different proteins within the cell. So in this picture on the left, the green is a protein that shows that they are microglia. And that's really important. So we have to check that they are what, what they think, what we think they are. And then we can also, once we've done that, look at these cells live. So these are live experiments and we can see how they're moving over time. 
and whether they're taking in proteins um, differently. And we can compare those controls and those mutants against each other and see if they're behaving in different ways that sort of implies whether they're more or less healthy. And this might then sort of um, tell us whether there are any treatment options that sort of focus on um, those pathways. So that was a quick uh, whistle stop tour of my uh, stem cell experience. I'm happy to have any questions. Thank you so much, Rachel. That's a really great um, introduction into all things stem cells and how they're used in um, to research dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases. So there are some questions from Rachel coming into the Q&A and we'll address them at the end of today's session. Next, we're gonna have Professor Sonia Gandhi as our speaker for today. Uh, Sonia is a clinician scientist working on neurodegenerative diseases with her lab. Um, and we're gonna hear about career as well as some science. So Sonia, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Let me just share my screen. Um... Right. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm going to try and give you a um, whistle stop tour of the work that I do as a clinician scientist. That means that I'm a consultant neurologist and I see patients here in the top right in a hospital. It's called the Cradle of British Neurology. It's the National Hospital for Neurology in London. And we see patients only with neurological diseases there. And I run a research program um, at the Francis Crick Institute, which you've just seen a little clip on um, uh, just below. So one very historical building and one very, very sort of modern research institute. So um, I guess um, thinking about my motivation. So I'm very interested in translational neuroscience and that's really summarized by this image at the top. The idea that you begin with patients and trying to understand their conditions and, and the diseases that affect them in the brain. And then you go in to try to understand what's happening in their brain and then what's happening in their cells and then down to their DNA and RNA. And then you might try to um, take those discoveries and understanding and come back out to try and design treatments for patients and eventually give them back into patients. And ChatGPT gave me this really nice um, bit to my talk where I said, you know, what does it mean to be a neurologist and a neuroscientist? And I thought it summarized it really well, that really what we like to do is to understand the intricacies of the brain and the nervous system, and then use that knowledge, though, to improve the lives of patients. Um, but what is a career in tr translational neuroscience like? It's um, it's pretty tough because you have to train in both um, medicine and become a physician. Um, as well as in neuroscience so that you can you know, make the scientific discoveries that we think will make a difference. Um, so I tend to show my career like a winding road, sometimes ending in a cliff. Um, and I guess the thing to say about that winding road is that the journey is probably more important than where we end up. Um, it's a journey that I've really enjoyed. Um, and I started out, I actually did maths, chemistry, biology and French for my A-levels. I then went to do undergraduate medicine in um, Cambridge, where I did a year of neuroscience. And then I went off to do my clinical medical degree um, in Oxford for three years. And following that became a house officer and then a senior house officer, now foundation years one and, and CMT years. And that was about four years. And there I was training to become you know, a cardiologist, a respiratory physician, a hematologist. Um, and after that period, I then took out three years to do a PhD in neuroscience, which I did at UCL, and I started to study um, a genetic form of Parkinson's disease. And after that, I then went on to be, do my specialist training and become a registrar in neurology. That took me six years because part of it, I went part time and became a lecturer as well. And so I did uh, medical training really 50 percent of my time and was a, a was doing research at the same time, about 50% of my time. And then shortly after that, I set up my own laboratory where I became a PI, what's called a principal investigator. Um, and around about the same time, I also became a consultant neurologist. I remember very clearly a month where I became a consultant. So leading the clinical team in the hospital and um, leading a lab. And I, by that time, had my third child. So it was gave me a headache every day for about a month um, with that rich kind of responsibility. But you sort of adapt and get used to that. And then um, I was made professor of neurology in um, 2021 during the pandemic. So um, both sides, as you can imagine, trying to become a neuroscientist and trying to become a neurologist um, are fraught with challenges, um, but are also intensely rewarding. 
Um, being a physician allows me to understand patients. I really enjoy the human side of, um, of practicing medicine. Um, and it tells me the problems that need solving. So every day I see, I see patients on Mondays and Tuesdays that have neurological diseases. Um, I then come back to the lab uh, for the rest of the week and, and really try to understand what, what's happening in their brains. Um, so I think the most important thing is finding the question that you want to answer. And whatever that question is, it should be an important one, I think, for your careers. Um, for me, it's um, trying to understand how to treat Parkinson's disease. And, you know, it's a really important question. Neurodegenerative disorders affect about 7 million people in Europe. And globally, Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurological disease and the second commonest neurodegenerative disorder. And if you think about the amount of, of expense that is that goes towards the care of patients with, this, with neurodegenerative diseases, it's about 1% of global GDP. But in fact, most of that is actually on care. And that's because simply we have no treatments, we have no ways of preventing the disease, and we have no cure. So there really is just so much to be done in this area. So let me tell you now briefly what is Parkinson's and how I understand it and then um, how I study it. So, I mean, back in the sort of Sanskrit literature and in, in the East Asian literature, it's been described for several thousand years. But in the Western literature, uh, James Parkinson back in 1817 would wander around the streets of Hoxton and he would see people with this um, way of walking, sort of stooped over a shuffling gait and a tremor. And he called this the shaking palsy. Um, and what's happening inside the brains of patients with Parkinson's is that the neurons or the brain cells that produce a chemical called dopamine start to die off. So the brain is now low in dopamine. Well, what does dopamine do? Dopamine is a really important chemical for uh, cognition and learning. It's also really important for movements, though. And so people who have less dopamine in their brain have problems with movements. Um, and interestingly, it's also the neurochemical of reward. So uh, when something good happens to you or um, it, when people do sort of high risk behaviors and they get um, a lot of pleasure from that, um, uh, the circuitry that it's involved with addiction as well, they all use dopamine. So dopamine is a very important chemical in the brain. Now for Parkinson's disease though, I might see a patient just around here at time zero on this graph where they have bradykinesia rigidity and tremor. And what that means is that they may have uh, a shake that they may have stiff limbs and their movements may be reduced. And over the next 20 years, what will happen is I will look after those patients and they will develop other disorders, problems with their memory as the disease actually spreads through the brain. And um, 20 years prior to that, they're coming to see a doctor. In fact, they will have had other problems that they may not have noticed, constipation, a sleep disturbance that this is um, very well depicts, the idea that you might act out your dreams during a phase of sleep that we are normally um, paralyzed, uh, depression, losing your sense of smell, and all of these happen in what we call the prodromal phase. So what's happening inside the brain during um, this course is in the prodromal phase, the condition we think is very restricted here just in the brainstem, and then it begins to spread through the brain um, and eventually affecting many, many brain areas. And the way we map the disease currently is a sort of very crude way of doing it. So this is a brain cell from a piece of postmortem brain tissue. And um, Louis described back in 1923, this large round area that you can see. And that's just basically a clump of abnormal protein called alpha synuclein. And it causes the Louis body that's inside neurons. Um, and, you know, 100 years later, we still use exactly the same thing to understand where this pathology is. So why is Parkinson's incurable? And I'm going to tell you about three scientific methods that we're doing to try and unlock this. It's probably because it's very, very hard to see the events that are happening in the Parkinson's brain. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about scale. You know, when we think about the human brain, it has 80 billion neurons and it has maybe 160 billion glial cells, the other uh, cell type. And then there are many thousands of different types within it. So the, just the sheer complexity of the human brain makes it very, very difficult to understand. And I'll talk about some of the methods we've used to try and overcome complexity. 
And then finally, when we think about other diseases, we might take, for example, a cancer out of a patient and look at it under a microscope and then study it and then design a therapy for it. But actually in neuroscience, the big challenge is we just simply can't do that for the human brain. So we need to build models of the human brain. And many of these diseases are uniquely human. And so actually some of the animal models that people used aren't always necessarily going to be um, ideal to study the disease. So I said I'd start with um, scale. So if we think that that Lewy body, that big clumping of protein that I explained is around the order of micrometers and a cell is, you know, sitting here between 10 and 20 micrometers. So we can see that actually, you know, with a standard microscope. But a Lewy body is made up of what we call fibrils. But they don't just appear. They come actually from a protein that starts off in life as being something that's actually only nanometers large. And that protein will start to assemble and come together and form these little aggregates called oligomers. They eventually form fibrils and they eventually get deposited. So you can understand then that if you wanted to see the earliest events that are happening and understand what causes Parkinson's, you really need to be looking at things that are nanometers in size, that's the size of a virus, for example. And one of the problems um, for those who are doing physics will know that the diffraction limit of light is about 250 nanometers. And so it's very, very difficult to distinguish small objects. So we can't find small objects very easily in complex systems. Well, Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize winner and he said in his famous lecture, um, it's really easy to answer biology. You just have to look at it. So how do we look at really small things? So we can look at animal cells, look at bacteria, we've got standard microscopy methods, and we can look at, you know, molecules using various methods. But how are we going to look at these nanometer objects that start to form in Parkinson's disease? And the solution to that is something called super resolution microscopy that won the Nobel Prize some years ago. And the way it works is that you can have a fluorescence image that is um, uh, has all the fluorescence turned on and looks like a fuzzy image. But if instead you make each fluorescence molecule blink, turn on and off, and you collect that hundreds and thousands of times, you then can get a highly resolved picture, as you can see the logo of the Francis Crick Institute, instead of this fuzzy low um, resolution image. And so what we've done is take those methods, and what we've done is take them to the human brain now to ask the question, can we see the smallest protein aggregates that form in the Parkinson's brain? And what we've done to do that is to um, uh, take some post-mortem brain tissue from patients with Parkinson's disease. It's not live tissue, it's dead tissue. We've stained what you're seeing here is an astrocyte. And then we've been able to use our high resolution imaging to dive into that cell and look at in yellow, all of these very, very small protein assemblies that start to, to aggregate and cause Parkinson's disease. So you can see we're moving from those very crude maps that I showed you at the beginning into actually really, really detailed maps um, of the human brain using this method. But we can go one step further, um, which is essentially to take brain and separate it out cell by cell or nucleus by nucleus and pass it through a sequencer. And you've seen this already from Joe's talk. What this is showing you every single spot is essentially about 20,000 data points of the message called the RNA in every single cell of the human brain. So now what I can do is not only see where all the protein aggregates are, all the kind of disease hallmark is, but I can also understand all the pathways that are dysregulated in every cell type. And I can put that together. We work with engineers who create these brain portals um, and put all of this data together and ultimately come up with a functional map, uh, more like a Google map that has multiple layers of what's happening to the human brain tissue. And this is our, our big ambition to describe this map in, in unprecedented detail. Well, I talked about scale and a bit about complexity. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about um, with my research is about stem cell technology. And that's really how we build personalized models of the human brain in a dish. And you've already heard this, so I, I don't have to go back to the beginning, which is great, but this won the Nobel Prize back in 2012 where it was discovered that you could take a cell that has already had its fate determined. So a skin cell, for example, is what we use, and you could reprogram it and turn it back into a stem cell. And um, my lab made a game, a stem cell game, which they show at the Francis Crick Institute. Um, and in that game, you essentially um, take a stem cell, 
This is the stem cell personal card that they use, enjoys the simple life, things in life, it loves being part of a crowd, it's full of potential, which is true about a stem cell, it can become any cell in the body. Um, they then give it a series of chemicals or postcodes to send it to the human brain to become a neuron, for example. The neuron has its own set of features and personalities, but you could also send it to become an immune cell, like a microglial cell, for example. Um, and we use this technology to build human brains inside a dish. Um, it's very exciting now because I can take uh, a cell, I can see a patient in clinic and I can take their cells and I can turn them into stem cells and then I can grow them up and look at them as neurons. And what you're seeing here are neurons from the front of the brain, the cortex, which is uh, uh, where memory is, is, is largely encoded. And I can also make what we call midbrain neurons, which are the back of the brain, uh, which are the neurons that first start to become diseased in Parkinson's disease. So now I can make the right cell type. And we can even go further than that and make little organoids, which are three dimensional structures shown here, where we have multiple cell types. And these are our mini brains in a dish. And now we can use cells in a dish to really study mechanism. So what you're seeing here is when we've now, before we, I showed you a cell in a human brain, but now we're diving inside that human neuron and we're using ultrastructural methods called electron microscopy. And you're seeing the nucleus, the large thing that encodes, has all the DNA that encodes the blueprint of the cell. But you can also start to see mitochondria and you can start to see lysosomes and other features of the cell. And we can watch the protein, which you're seeing in blue and then orange, um, aggregating inside the human neuron. And that gives us really loads of insight into where proteins start to aggregate. And that process is happening in all of us all the time, but why is it happening in disease and why can't we clear it? And we went on to um, publish these papers really describing this process inside the human brain. And as the Guardian said about this set of papers, it's actually just hugely complex, of course, how we're trying to understand um, these processes inside human cells and in the human brain. So the other thing you can do once you have a model of the disease in a dish is you can um, take all of the things that are being trialed out in drug trials. So at the same time, because I'm a physician, I'm also involved in drug trials on patients. And we have trials of gene editing therapies, which James then will take into the dish and try out on our models of brain cells in the dish. We have trials um, uh, of inflammation. We have trials that look at diabetic drugs in Parkinson's um, and trials that look at sort of how we clear proteins. And then those same drugs, we can understand how they're working in the neuron in the dish. And that's really important for drug discovery. But we can also use um, the stem cell derived neurons for another aspect, which is to try and understand whether we can use machine learning approaches on a patient's brain cells that are now in our dish to try to subtype them into the different subtypes of disease. And we build these convolutional neural networks that can try to understand what type of disease does a patient have and which type of drug might they be amenable to. Um, and so the power of this approach of making your own model of a patient's brain in a dish is really, really very powerful. Well, the other aspect of being a clinician, of course, is to go from the molecules that we identified inside neurons to um, how drugs work to actually giving drugs to patients. But that process is really very, very slow. Um, and we're part of a very big in initiative called Accelerating Clinical Trials in Parkinson's, which is trying to transform and speed up the testing of treatments, recognizing that we're at this critical time point because we know that there are going to be more than 12 million people with this condition by 2040. So again, this is more what I do as a clinician then. Um, I can look back at trials and the way trials work is that we conduct a phase one trial to look at sort of safety for a drug. We then conduct a phase two trial, which is shown in orange here. And um, that is looking at small numbers of patients. And then what happens is many years later, a phase three trial is done. And that looks at hundreds and hundreds of patients and gives them a drug and tries to see if it's going to be beneficial. And if it's successful at phase three, then it goes into clinical care, which means we can then use it in the clinic. And what you'll see from this analysis is that there aren't many drugs that have gone through in 20 years in Parkinson's. But it takes a very, very long time to find the result. They've all ended in failure, unfortunately, to date. But essentially, at the end of a stage three trial, you're talking 10 to 15 years later. 
which is really difficult for patients who have this condition to wait th for this very long time. So we're trying something totally different. Um, next year, we're planning the largest trial uh, for Parkinson's patients in the UK. It's going to have 50 sites. And what we're doing is a bit like what happened in the pandemic with COVID recovery. So what happens is that we have one control arm and we have multiple uh, treatment arms running simultaneously, a bit like a racehorse. And then if something's ineffective, we drop it out and take on a new drug to try. So we're constantly trying out drug after drug until we find um, a treatment that, that is successful. Um, and so we're hoping to start this um, with 2000 patients um, at the end of next year. So that takes me back to the end of the journey and back to sort of what we're doing in patients. And I think I would just summarize by saying a career in translational neuroscience has been wonderful for me. Um, you know, the values that we think about at the CRIC, we have um, a value set that is about trying to do discovery without boundaries, trying to be sort of free thinking. Um, at UCL, we think about disruptive thinking. They're the really key ideas together with boldness and creativity that I think really help a scientist to um, unlock a lot of the mysteries um, of the brain. And I think people who like those sorts of values and like those sorts of careers will be able to bring um, those values to bear and, and hopefully one day we will be able to, to find a cure for these very challenging diseases. And with that, I'm just gonna thank these all the people who give money to our research programs, but most importantly, thank all the patients who take part in the trials and the patients who donate skin cells um, and uh, also brain at, um, at post-mortem uh, for us to use for our research. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. Um, that was really just an incredible journey from looking at molecules using super resolution microscopy all the way up to now implementing some things in the clinic. So just fantastic. And there are lots of questions coming in in the Q&A box. Um, so we'll try to address a lot of those at the end of today's session. Um, so next we have our second Follow Me Around the Lab video for today. This was made by Edmund in the Edinburgh Dementia Research Institute. Um, Edmund works on Drosophila, which are fruit fly models of disease. Um, and so you're going to hear a little bit more about that now. If you want to sneak into a fly lab, follow me. We received a new order of fresh fly food this morning. After storing the food, I can get into the work for today. I will transfer the flies from the old valve onto new valve, with which contain new food. This is called fly keeping. A few hours later, I can bring the flies back to the shelf and the flies are all on fresh food and ready to go for the next fold. We also have other projects going on in the lab. I'm doing a lifespan experiment where these flies are expressing a certain pattern, and I want to see how detrimental this pattern is and how long they are going to live with this pattern they are expressing. These incubators are set to 25 degrees. So, thank you so much, Edmund, for that insight into what his um, work is about and how they um, use fly models and the basics of kind of handling those in the lab on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so our final session for today is two more flash talks. 
And first we have Emily Beale from the Air Research and Technology Centre at Imperial College London. And Emily is a research coordinator. So this is a non-lab role and we're excited to kind of hear more about that. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm the research coordinator at the UK Dementia Research Institute um, and I, at the Care Research and Technology Centre. And I'm going to chat to you about the uh, work that I do as a research coordinator that's outside of a lab setting. So the study that I work on is called MINDER. It's a little different from research in a lab with cells. Um, so it's a clinical study, meaning that I work with people in their homes. So it's a smart home system that uses assistive technology, such as sensors and health equipment to monitor someone living with dementia. And this environment really helps people with dementia and their carers uh, to allow them to help to let them live at home for longer. So one of my favourite things about clinical research and the study is that it's helping people living with dementia and their families now, um, as well as in the future. So for me, one of those important things for clinical research is people. So this is the participants perspective from people taking part in our study. So these are participants who have taken part in Minder and quotes from and um, that they've said about taking part in the research. I've been lucky enough to have many lovely conversations and cups of tea with them and being able to see that the research we're doing is helping them really drives me um, more into wanting to work in a career in this field. So one aspect of my role is completing home visits and questionnaires uh, with participants and their family members uh, to help understand more about how their dementia affects them. So being able to be compassionate and give them a safe space to answer questionnaires can make a really big difference to them. And it's also really valuable to the researchers analysing the data, as well as the people taking part. So it allows the participants, and more often than not their families too, uh, to feel like they're not on their own. And my nan lived with dementia for many years and thinking about how this type of research could have helped her at the time and really motivates me to help others. So how did I get to where I am today? Uh, so my A-levels were biology, maths and history. Um, I really enjoyed the idea of a healthcare role and working with people, but I wasn't sure about the specifics. So it's absolutely OK not to be sure what you want to do. Um, I ended up going to university and did a degree in biomedical sciences. Um, so it's a very, very varied degree. So I did lots of different modules in neuroscience, sort of pharmacology, development, nutrition, like you name it, I probably studied it in some capacity. And it also gave me some lab experience, um, sort of in the wet lab with the white coats, which actually made it realize that it really wasn't the kind of role that I enjoyed. Um, and after graduating, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I applied uh, to a research assistant role within an NHS research team working across mental health and dementia studies. So this is again with people rather than in a lab, um, and it can range from doing questionnaires with people, um, taking blood tests, and I've also been lucky enough to work on drug trials within Alzheimer's disease. I started working at the Dementia Research Institute last year, working on the MINDER study. So I'm essentially responsible for the day-to-day -day management of where the research takes place in two different places. So that's within the community, going into people's homes, and also within a care home setting. So what is a research coordinator? So uh, you can be a sort of research practitioner or research assistant, or other names and words that, are, can, that can be used. And you're essentially responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the study. Uh, you're usually based in a hospital or a university setting. You can have a wide variety of backgrounds. So like I said, so my background is biomedical science, but I've worked with people who do um, psychology, pharmacology, um, nursing, sort of any sort of health-related discipline is a really transferable um, sort of skill set. And you, you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into one thing. Um, so there's lots of <clears throat> transferable skills and like I said you can take part in research in lots of different settings so it doesn't have to be uh, dementia and mental health or Parkinson's you could do sort of respiratory cardiology cancer there's lots of different options and roles available so within mind specifically I sort of tried to think about what I spent most of my time doing and most of it is participant interaction speaking with people getting them interested in the study completing the assessments with them and having that ability to sort of explain really complex scientific ideas and studies uh, to a wider audience so they can understand the information is really important and having those communication skills is really key 
And having attention to detail when you're completing the assessment is also really important. And as much as we'll try and avoid it, there is quite a lot of documentation when it comes to research. So having really good organisational skills is also really important. Obviously, working within a big study team and having the opportunity to train new research uh, team members, having really good teamwork skills. And um, I don't do it anymore, but being able to handle biological samples is an important part of the role usually as well. So just to bring it back really quickly, the main difference between lab research and clinical research is the people, and they really are at the heart of everything we do. Um, I'm really happy to answer any questions. I've left my email there, and you can add me and connect on LinkedIn if you'd like to. I've also left a QR code, which is a link to a video that we did working with the Mind of Participants, which is a really lovely summary for the work that we're doing at the Care Research and Technology Centre. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really fantastic. And it's really nice to see kind of another side of science research. Um, and that kind of actually quite well addresses some of the questions we were having. So some people were wondering, how do you get involved in more participant based research and um, maybe outside of the lab if you do a biomedical science or in your science degree? Um, and so as Emily said, please do feel free to contact her if you have any more questions about that. Um, great. So. We now have our final speaker for today, um, which is Viola Zelek from the University of Cardiff uh, Dementia Research Institute. And um, so I'm going to let you go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Cleona, for this kind introduction. It's great to be here and welcome everyone. Um, I try, I very mind the timing, so I will be quick, I promise. Um, so I thought my career journey would look like this, very nice and simple. And that was very naive of me to think that because really it looked like that. Um, there were times where I, there was really no path or there was really hard to find any steps um, to go forward. But what you really notice is that I always had someone with me supporting me or helping me to work out my next steps. And I think this is really important when you plan your uh, career and there is always someone like your parent or your teacher or a senior colleague that can um, send you to the right direction. Um, and for me, that person is Professor Paul Morgan, which has uh, been my mentor for quite a few years. Um, he's also based at Cardiff University, which is approachable, and I can uh, ask him any questions anytime, which not always uh, is great for him. Um, <clears throat> and this is my career path. So as you may guess, I come from Poland, from my accent, and I graduated uh, quite a while back and then um, I uh, looked for jobs and managed to find a job in NHS, which I worked as a, a laboratory um, assistant for a year. And then I moved into a biotech companies, uh, BBI and RSR, which I stayed for a while because I really enjoy it. And it was a great place to work in. Um, and I, I gained some lab experience. I quite quickly became a um, senior scientist. So that was fun. My Richard at a level where I thought, that's it now, I can't really progress anymore. I, I know all the processes inside out. So I diverted back to academia and took job as a research technician, uh, which was a bit, bit, a bit big uh, salary cut. But um, I thought changing the, the path would be good for me. Um, and after that, I managed to do PhD in the same lab. And that progressed into independent um, funding, which are the fellowships. So these are the three ones. And I'm currently a, a RAD fellow. I say a warm welcome to all the RAD fellows on the call. Um, and I'm hoping that this fellowship will enable me to apply for a senior fellowships, which will um, allow me to progress into a professor in a few years time. So I do my best to do this, to achieve this with my publications as shown here, nice and steady growth. Most of my work is focused on translational research. Uh, so making drugs. But I also do a fair amount of basic research um, and I explain in a minute what it is. Um, I also work on blood biomarkers, as others mentioned uh, multiple times. And I've got a little bit of COVID left over from pandemic, which I'm trying very hard to get rid of. <laughs> um, and thinking about all those three sectors I work in, academia, NHS, industry, um, they all have the good and bad, uh, and I listed here, I know there's no time to go through individually for each of them. I'm happy to share the slides. But why I've chosen to be in academia, it is because I'd like to be an expert. 
And what academia gives me is a freedom, flexibility, um, anatomy, and I can collaborate with people all around the globe uh, and I can travel around um, to meet everyone for conferences and so on. So this is why I chose this path. Um, what I work on is neuroimmune interactions. What does it mean? It's actually studying uh, roles of immune systems, uh, immune system in the brain. Um, the part of the immune system I'm working on is called complement system. So it's very much um, very first respond of the uh, immune system to uh, to insult. Um, and once complement gets overactivated, can drive inflammation, and too much inflammation in the brain dr drives disease. So what I'm trying to do is looking for uh, drugs which can prevent that happening. Um, and the diseases I'm looking for are schizophrenia, dementia, on a big um, note, uh, and central nervous system diseases. And how my uh, date uh, looks like. So I, I may my main focus is on service and support of my team. So making sure they have everything they need to conduct the experiments and every support they, they might uh, require. Uh, um, a lot of time I spend on writing uh, grants uh, and papers and literature review. And I go to places, as I mentioned, conferences to present my work. Um, and I still love to be in the lab. Uh, it's less and less happening, but um, this is the best part of my job yeah, in my mind. So I'm learning how to lead uh, and I'm in this transition coming from a bench researcher into a, a PI. And if I can leave you with one thing, uh, it's this one today, choose the job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. For me, working in academia is, um, is a lifestyle and just remember to have someone with you with this journey uh, to help you understand all the um, politics and so on going on um, and, and send you the right direction when you don't know what to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic insight into your um, career. And I like that you kind of are planning forward as well. It's nice to see that you're kind of thinking of your next steps as well um, and some great advice. Um, so now I'm going to ask if the panel could now turn back on their cameras um, and we're going to answer some of the questions that have come up in the Q&A. I also understand that some of the panel might need to leave shortly for other commitments and that's okay. Um, but for those who can stay around, that would be fantastic. Um, and just one very common question is how people can get access to this recording after the event. And these will be posted on YouTube. Um, shortly after the events are finished and um, anyone that registered should be emailed out a link to access again um, and by watching those recordings you can also see some contact details for some of the speakers who put those on their slides um, and if your question isn't answered that can be a way to reach out and, and, and get those answered as well and um, so without further ado and um, one question with a lot of um, votes for it is asking um, to Sonia Gandhi, what is the limitation of using dead brain tissue to see proteins using microscopy? But maybe other people can comment on how it affects their techniques as well. Yeah, that's a great question. So most of what we've understood about why proteins aggregate um, in, in all neurodegenerative diseases has come from getting a protein and putting it in some buffer in a test tube and shaking the test tube. And then in the context of a clear solution, it's really easy to use methods like super resolution methods um, to look at proteins because the background is very, very clear. You then try to do it inside a human cell or even a biofluid like the cerebrospinal fluid or blood. And it's quite difficult because you've got loads of other proteins interfering. And then inside tissue, especially post-mortem tissue, um, there's a, a very, very high signal coming from the background that's not specific. So in all of the complex, but it, take a step back, but the answer is going to be how do proteins uh, aggregate inside the system that we're most interested in, right? The human tissue and the, the human cells. So what we have to do is everything in, in the way we detect things is about signal, the signal we're interested in and noise, which is the background. And we have to boost the signal, which is what we do very frequently with uh, fluorescence microscopy techniques. And we have to reduce the noise. And so what we do to reduce the noise is we use a lot of background reduction techniques. So we apply and prepare the tissue in ways that try to reduce any of the 
what we call autofluorescence or background that would then stop you seeing the signal. And under those conditions, we can start to see the signals from conventional microscopy um, uh, as well as super resolution microscopy. I hope that explains it. That's great. Um, so we've also got quite a common thread of questions that I'm going to try and um, weave into one. So quite a few people are asking about getting some experience either in the summer during university or while still at school and how they maybe can go about getting some of those opportunities. Um, so Joe, I wonder if you could comment first as someone who kind of runs a lab, how you would like people maybe to, to get in touch and that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, one person put it in the chat that you, you can reach out to the supervisor. Uh, you can send them an e email. The, the key thing I would say with that is do not just copy and paste a bit of standard text and send it to 100 PIs. Uh, and we, it, it really helps if uh, it looks like you have looked up our research, why you're interested in what we are doing, the techniques, the scientific questions. And if you outline that and any skills that you already have that you think would then fit in with, with what we're doing. So, but I mean, I, for me, I'm, I'm more than happy to receive emails uh, from people who are looking uh, to get experience. And um, we do have a lot of students already, you know, Imperial, the students here that we take on over the summer. So, you know, obviously it's hard to, you know, our lab is only a certain size to take everyone, but um, I think I'm more than happy to, um, to hear from people. Okay, that's great advice. And Deborah, you mentioned that you did some, um, kind of summer work during our internships during your time at university and while you were studying. So maybe you could comment on what that was like and also how you kind of got those opportunities. Yeah, so my summer studentship was almost like an extension of my, not quite an extension, but I did it after my third year, which at UCL, our third year is just a completely different degree. So I did a degree in neuroscience after having done two years of med. Um, and after that neuroscience degree, um, I stayed on with the same supervisor that I'd had for my BSc project in that neuroscience degree um, and did that eight week studentship, which involved. So um, we had to apply for funding. Um, and so I was funded by the biomedical, what was it? Biochemical Society, I think it was. Um, so we applied for funding. And then when we'd got it, um, I just did eight weeks of similar research to what I was doing during my BSc project, but slightly different because they specifically said they can't be a continuation of a project. Um, so we were looking at different mouse models that I'd, to the ones I'd been looking at for my um, BSE. Um, but yeah, so it was basically just that. I don't know if I've answered your question. No, I think that's really helpful for people to hear. And I think um, maybe people would be like happy to know that it's more when you kind of get to university stage that it's more common to do to do these type of kind of internships. Um, although tomorrow I'll just flag as part of our session, we have someone who did a week of work experience and um, after watching Making It Brain last year, they contacted one of the researchers on the panel and they got to do a week of work experience while they were still in school. And that's something you'll hear about tomorrow if you're attending. Actually, just quickly on that, um, I was able to get my brother some work experience in our lab when he was in, I think, when year 10. Um, so often it's connections. Um, but yeah, he was able to do a week of work, work experience when he was in year 10 in the science lab too, which was useful for him. Yeah, brilliant. Great to hear. Um, so I have a question, I think, aimed at Rachel. Um, so the question asks, how are you able to get DNA with mutations in it? Is this done within the lab or do you seek out specific patients? Um, yeah, so I um, I got my stem cells from a company. So we um, some other people had already made the stem cells from the patients, um, but they're just controls. So they just have um, they haven't got any disease background. And then when I've got the stem cells in the lab, I do the experiment there. So I'm in um, like a sterile cabinet um, and then we add the different enzymes and the template into the cells and then you have to nuclear affect them. So it sort of opens up the nucleus and allows the, the, the compounds to go into the nucleus um, and then they sort of do their thing there. That answers your question. Yeah, that's really great. 
Um, and it's really cool to hear about this, how like a lot of people on the panel are actually using stem cells in their research now, um, and that it's quite an accessible technology. Um, I have a question for those who have worked in industry or places other than academia. Um, so it says, is pursuing a career in industry rather than academia a favorable a favorable choice post PhD, considering factors such as salary, stability, and alignment with the field expertise. Uh, do you want me to kick off on that one? Maybe. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I went as a postdoc in the industry, um, and it was. I mean, and then after a couple of years, was made a permanent research scientist. Uh, it's pros and cons, to be honest. Um, in terms of career stability, I, I don't know if it's any much better. Um, yes, I, I had a permanent contract, so often in academia you don't. Um, however, my the reason I left was the research I was doing um, was stopped, and that that always that you know that often happens in industry that. And I decided that I was going to move instead of doing a different um, um, side of research. So, um, I mean, everyone always asks about the money. For me personally, it was not hugely different to uh, the positions I've had in academia. Um, yeah, I think they were the main points. Yeah, I think so. And maybe, Viola, could you just also comment on kind of your experience about that? Yes, I agree with Joe. It really depends what you need um, and what is important for you. If stability and uh, consistency is what you're looking for, then perhaps industry. But if you need a challenge and you want to progress fast and develop your own ideas, then I would recommend taking academia route. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, there is a Quite a lot more questions, but I'm just going to pick two main kind of themes to follow up on. And um, one is that it was mentioned in some of the videos and some of the talks that people use coding in their research now. And some questions are focused on whether people, if they're interested in doing more computational uh, research, whether you think it's um, a good path to pursue neuroscience at university or computer science and kind of where those two intersections come in. And I was wondering, maybe, Emily, this might be a little bit outside the scope for you, but because you work in the Care Research and Technology Centre, I wonder if you know about what your colleagues are, kind of where their background's from, and do you know if there's computer scientists or are they mainly neuroscientists? Um, yeah, I can try my best. So the Care Research and Technology, we have lots of different, um, sort of, we have neurologists, engineers, um, like you said, computer scientists, lots of different people that are all working together on the same thing. Um, Honestly, I think my advice would sort of be to do something you really enjoy more. And it's not necessarily necessary, it's not necessary to do one way or the other as long as you're doing something that you want to do. So if you prefer the neuroscience and the idea of the cells and the lab, then go in that direction. And if you think actually I'd be better off at a computer or do something, then you can do that way. And you can probably use those skills from either to cross into the other side when it gets to that point, if that's still what you want to do. So try not to panic about decisions you're making now in the future. Yeah, brilliant. And I was just going to ask Sonia, as someone who kind of has this mixed technologies across your lab, do you ever employ more computer science based people or do you generally have people coming through the neuroscience and stream? Yeah, I, that's a great question, really. I mean, I think, you know, um, we've done a lot of cellular neuroscience, but computational neuroscience is just a huge, huge field. And when we did our first machine learning program, um, we got everyone in the lab who come from many different backgrounds. I've seen some questions about sort of psychology degrees. We've got somebody who's come from psychology into neuroscience, people who've come from medicine into neuroscience. So they've come from many different backgrounds. Um, but actually having skills, coding is very helpful for that. And in the end, it turned out none of them had. They're all sort of probably a bit older than everyone on the call and, and had sort of missed that wave. And I had to get my daughter's coding teacher to come in and teach everybody how to use python first and then how to um, apply and, and develop these neural networks to try and solve the problem we had so i think there are huge opportunities if you're inclined towards computational and um, data science approaches i think you might hear some of that tomorrow maybe amina's talk for example um but um 
um, there's also the opportunity to leave that behind and, and have a totally different part of, of uh, neuroscience. But um, I think understanding the computational approaches and what their power is, is, is helpful. Yeah, I think, especially even as a PhD student now, I'm noticing how more and more of my peers are starting to go into these more omics based um, techniques like Joanna was discussing um, and how having skills in coding is, is really beneficial. Um, but it is something you can learn along the way if you're more interested in, in pursuing a more direct neuroscience route. Um, and I think um, one other question kind of is about what is the most exciting thing about your research and, and kind of where is all this research going? Um, and so I think if we could have a final word from everyone maybe about kind of that question, just what's most exciting to you and where do you think your field is going? And um, so maybe, um, Joe, we'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the most exciting thing is when I have a, a student or postdoc come and show me a graph that they're not entirely sure about, but it looks exciting. And you think about it and actually it is, it's really exciting. A new, new bit of data that has not been done before. I think that makes all the kind of uh, challenges in research kind of worthwhile for those for those moments um and so what was your second question um where do you kind of think your research is bringing the field yeah absolutely so um i think in terms of the omics research to be able to understand uh, causality of disease i think it's really really important um but i also have a whole section on um, synapses as well and i think that actually comes from the other side and that's really trying to get at what is, um, what is driving the symptoms that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so putting those two together, I think in terms of drug therapy, you can have more disease modifying therapies and those that target the symptoms as well. So seeing them come together, I think is hopeful. Yeah, really exciting. Um, would anyone else like to, to go about kind of what's exciting about their research? Viola, maybe you're unmuted. Yes. Um, so. I'd like to say that I'm really excited seeing new drugs being approved for Alzheimer's disease, very first drugs. Uh, we never had treatment before, so that is amazing progress. Um, yes, they do work for one third of the patients, and do we have to still look for new drugs, and this is where I'm coming into play in my research, and I'm hoping that the drugs I develop, which work in mouse, will be on some day translated into human therapies. And again, they might not work for everyone, but some people would respond, hopefully, uh, uh, where the immune system plays an important role. Uh, and that excites me. Fantastic. Um, and any other final comments about how what excites you, uh, Debbie? Yeah, so um, my, like I said, my research is mainly in like biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. And um, there's been a lot of, of like advancements in like blood now being used to diagnose. Um, and obviously I'm also making new tests. So I think it'll be really cool over the next year or two, seeing if the new tests are making work um, and if they do, whether they do what we think they'll do, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, quite exciting. Yeah, it's a really exciting time in diagnosis. Um, Sonia? Yeah, I think um, I think discovery is like at way more advanced than it ever was before. And it's really exciting to work at the interface between disciplines. So we work with chemists as well and physicists and engineers and data scientists and, and cellular scientists as well. And that and in between all of that is actually where a new discovery gets made. And that's a really, really exciting place to be. Um, and, and I am hopeful as well um, um, that, you know, we, we're moving into a much more advanced understanding of the human brain and human disease. And so, um, you know, as we, we, we all have to be hopeful um, that we will find better treatments, better diagnostics and better biomarkers. Fantastic. And it's great to hear all these passionate scientists talking about this as well today, because we know then the future is very bright for us. Um, Rachel? Yeah, um, I was just going to say that I, I just get so excited when an experiment actually works. <laughs> <laughs> That's like yeah. my main thing. Um, yeah, I, so I was talking about my CRISPR experiment that sort of took me like a year and a half. It sounds really quick, but it takes a really long time. And then when it actually works, it's very, very exciting. So Yeah, when something you've kind of poured your heart into for the last yeah. while, 
work yeah, with. especially okay. I think like yeah at this early career stage just something that I sort of designed and come up with having worked is very exciting amazing and Emily yeah I think just uh how the research that everyone's doing can sort of be used in loads of different capacities and we're moving forward and from where you think where we were sort of 10 15 years ago um to now is really exciting and just to say like for all the other panelists like all the research that you're doing looks amazing and like the variation of within one thing is um great so it's a really exciting um sort of area of research to be a part of at the moment i think that's an excellent note to end on i'm just quickly sharing um the final word for today which is um please come back tomorrow and we have plenty of other speakers touching on completely different topics um, including someone who came to make a brain, making a brain last year and got to do work experience with one of our speakers. And so please do come back, it's at 4 p.m. tomorrow. And just some people asked in the chat, making it for this is the third year and both the versions from 2021 and 2022 are available on our YouTube channel, which you can see here is the UK Dementia Research Institute. And tomorrow after the event, you will be sent a post event questionnaire. So this is a really short feedback form, but it's highly valuable for us to get your feedback and see what you would like um, for the event next year. And so if you're not available tomorrow, please still do fill that out. Um, and all that's left for me to do is thank our incredible panel for today. Apologies for running over a bit on time, but I think based on all the questions and all the uh, comments in the chat, this was a really, really appreciated event. Um, and thank you so much for your time. And thank you to all our attendees.